All right, part 300 intro to horticulture. We're gonna dive into cultural requirements of plants. And today we're gonna to be diving into climate zones specifically, okay? So if we're looking at what cultural conditions and requirements of plants are, we're looking at a set of really specific things that plants need or prefer in order to thrive in the location that they are growing, okay? So it's important to look at things like the temperature or the overall climate, light, a lot of times we call this solar exposure, okay? So sun exposure, how much sun does it need? How much water does the plant need? looking at fertility and nutrients. And we already went through that to some degree with our previous lecture on fertility and nutrients, soil composition, and the space or the room or the amount of area that a plant requires in order to grow into its mature size. Okay, so when we're selecting plants or considering growing plants in certain regions, we need to take into account the overall climate of that region and whether that climate is conducive to the overall health of the plant. And a lot of times the way that we try to do this is we look at what the origin of that plant is and what the climactic conditions are, where that plant originated from, and how well that is matched in the climate that we're proposing placing that plant for its lifetime, okay? So the goal here with looking at our plant, uh, at our plant needs and cultural conditions or requirements is that in horticulture, we generally aim to utilize plants that can survive without significant intervention in the climate or region that it's gonna be planted. And so recognizing what the overall climate is, is very important. If we, choose to push that a little bit too far. Okay, so for instance, if we are working in an area that is um, uh, desert-like conditions and we choose to utilize a plant that has a very high water demand, then that plant may or may not be able to survive, but it's going to need significant input that is abnormal for the overall climate. So if we want to use a plant in the desert that has a high water use, characteristic, the way that we can get that plant to live, right, and maybe thrive is to give it an abnormal amount of water for the climate, right? Any plant that develops or its origin is in the desert is going to be a low water use plant because of the inherent lack of water in that general climate zone. Okay, now for environmental horticulture, ornamental horticulture, um, landscape horticulture, this is really important to take into account because the more inputs we need to make to a system on an ongoing basis 
in order to keep a plant in healthy living condition, the more expensive it is. And beyond that, the likelihood that a plant will be under stress more often than not is really high. And when a plant is under stress, it's much more susceptible to pests and diseases. If a plant is not under stress, then it has a better ability to withstand pests and diseases. So the approach with this module going through culture plant needs and cultural requirements or conditions is to begin to recognize what it is that plants need. Obviously, certain temperatures, light, water, nutrients, soil, and a certain amount of room to thrive into. Okay, so recognizing that and learning how to find plants that will work within the location that the project is happening or where these plants are being grown for food or for sale. Now, in the horticulture world, we have figured out all these really cool ways to get around the existing areas or regions, general climate, light, water, nutrients, soil types, etc., by using things like greenhouses, right, where we can control the climate. And in terms of soil composition, if we're growing plants in a nursery for sale, we can utilize certain soil media that mimics what the plants origin, original or preferred soil composition is, okay? So the approach on this entire module to overview is we're gonna look at cultural conditions broadly. We're gonna look at each one of these, temperature, climate, light, water, fertility, nutrients. Again, we've already gone through fertility, nutrients, soil composition, and overall space or room. Okay, we're going to look at what those are, how we recognize them, how we identify which plants prefer which areas, um, how to identify um, uh, a good spot on a particular site that has certain light characteristics or sun light characteristics, etc. So we're going to look at this broadly so we have a really thorough understanding of it. And then we're going to go into ways that horticulture, right, for the professional horticulture world modifies things or throws heavier inputs into things in order to get things to grow again, either for sale or for food, etc. Okay, so we're diving into temperature or climate first. So what we're going to be going through is climate and microclimates, watersheds okay because it's uh watersheds is a big portion of it and if we're looking at things from a regional standpoint and frankly once we get down into the micro standpoint not even the regional standpoint we can it's really important to look at watersheds we're going to look at some plant communities we're going to look at climate zone systems and this is kind of the big one and then we're going to look at resources that um, you guys uh, can tap into in order to um, look at whether a plant uh, will work in certain climate zones. Okay. So looking at climate and microclimates. First of all, it's really important to recognize that in the majority of California, we live in a Mediterranean climate. Okay. The overall climate, broad regional, is a Mediterranean climate. Now, Mediterranean climates are distinguished by warm, wet winters, okay, under prevailing westerly winds, 
and calm, hot, dry summers, okay, we're experiencing a pretty calm, relatively hot, dry summer. Okay. Um, uh, and um, uh, winters, again, uh, typically, there are a decent amount of storms that come through that put down a decent amount of water, but that's generally the only time of year that Mediterranean regions receive precipitation or receive rainwater. The rest of the year, it's pretty dry. Now, I always think it's interesting to look at what the other Mediterranean regions are throughout the world. Of course, California, Mediterranean region. Chile, Mediterranean region. The namesake, Mediterranean Basin, okay, is the Mediterranean region. Western Cape of South Africa is Mediterranean. And then the southwestern Australia and southern Australia are Mediterranean regions. Now, what are the characteristics of these regions? Again, dry summers, wet winters. Generally, you have to irrigate plants in order to get them established. The regions themselves are all located along coasts midway between the equator and the poles. So if we jump back here, again, dry summer, wet winter, the location is coastal, all coastal, and located halfway between the equator and the poles, okay? So it's this inherent climate that's associated with the latitude and coastal influence and Western facing, okay? So the East Coast is not a Mediterranean climate. East coast of, even though it's between the equator and the pole, right? So all these locations are Western coastal, halfway between equator and poles. Other kind of interesting characteristic of Mediterranean climates is that typically they're quite prone to fire, earthquakes, and volcanic activity, right? We know this to be true of the California Mediterranean region. We know this to be true of the Mediterranean basin of South, Southern and Southwestern Australia, South Africa, and Chile, okay? All of these are kind of inherent within the Mediterranean regions. Now, I always think it's interesting, and um, sometimes people don't think of this too much, but the plants that we generally see selected and planted in landscapes or available for sale at local nurseries are plants that are found either in as natives to California or as natives to one of the other four, there are five total Mediterranean regions in the world. So other plants, um, uh, plants that we see primarily in our local nurseries and planted in ground in our Mediterranean region are generally plants that are found in one of the other four Mediterranean regions. So lavender, Escalonia is a central Chile native, 
aloes are native to South Africa. Coastal woolly bush, really cool plant that's native to Southwest Australia, Southern Australia. Okay, so these are plants, again, that we find in our Mediterranean regions throughout the world. And because California's Mediterranean region has really, really similar characteristics from a topographical, geographical, overall temperature, warm, dry summer, moderately cool, wet winter, right? So these plants are all adapted to those conditions. And so they're climate appropriate plants to select for plantings within California. Okay, so general overview here is Mediterranean climate. We live in a Mediterranean climate. And when we're selecting plants for these climates, it's appropriate to select plants that have evolved and adapted to our general temperature and moisture conditions, okay? Of course, there's plants from all over the world that are planted in our region, in California, okay? Um, there's lots of plants that we use from the East Coast. There's lots of plants, lots of plants that we use from Asia, other areas of Europe, various areas of North America and some South America, other areas throughout um, Africa, right? So it is possible to find plants that work well in California's Mediterranean climate that are not of Mediterranean origin, but the majority of plants that do really well in California without excessive amounts of input are plants from Mediterranean climates. So again, we're looking at sort of a macro climate. Okay? Now, there are also microclimates. Now, microclimates we can look at, and this is a, a graphic map of San Francisco. Okay? And this is the San Francisco microclimate map. Now, it's important to recognize that San Francisco is a really unique spot uh, in terms of its location um, in general, on the coast, tip of a peninsula, between a, a inland bay and the Pacific Ocean. It's also unique in its topography. Right? We know that the general characteristic of San Francisco is that it's a lot of hills, right? And with that, while it is in a Mediterranean climate, right, San Francisco is within a Mediterranean climate, there's inherent differences in the topography and its orientation towards the Pacific Ocean or the Bay that make each microclimate within this seven mile by seven mile area quite different. And there are some really distinct ones. So microclimates in general are a smaller area within a general climate zone that has its own unique climate. Okay, so if we look at this, the West Coast, this includes the outer sunset and ocean beach to Daly City. Okay, so here we've got the um, West Coast, what's considered the West Coast. And it has the characteristics of being cold and foggy with heavy winds. Now, there's also the Northwest Coast. That's outer Richmond to the Golden Gate Bridge. Here we've got the Northwest Coast. And this is cold with some fog and a little bit lighter winds. The western slopes, so relatively flat, okay? relatively flat through these regions on the coast. But then we get this area that's 
a sloped area that's adjacent to these coastal adjacent areas that are sort of, I guess, more flat. This is where we start to get into some higher elevations, some difference in topography going up slope. Now, this characteristic um, is cool to moderate in temperature, a mixture of foggy and clear days with lighter winds, certainly lighter winds than the west coast, the very exposed west coast. Next, we have the Marina District. Okay, we've got the Marina District in here. And the characteristics are cool to moderate, some fog with very light winds. Okay, and that Marina District is kind of down in more of a flat area. Southern neighborhoods, um, the southeast coast and southern border to Daly City. Okay, so this is that area. We've got moderate to hot, okay? So it's definitely warmer within the southern neighborhoods than the marina, western slopes, or either of the coastals. Generally, we have clear skies, more sun, and heavy winds. And then we have the east, which is quite a large one, here we have moderate to hot, clear skies, and lighter winds than the southern neighborhoods. Okay, And the majority of this is specifically influenced. Some of it may more or less be influenced by the, um, the built environment. And we'll get into the built environment, how that affects microclimate on more of a site basis. But for the most part, these areas, right, these different microclimates within San Francisco are predominantly influenced by slope and coastal influence or marine influence, being Pacific Ocean, tip of the peninsula, or within the bay. Okay. So little seven mile by seven mile area that San Francisco is within has its own overall climate zone, right? But within that, there's a lot of microclimates that can be recognized in order to make proper plant selections. Diving a little bit more into microclimates, what influences microclimates? Again, back to this, this is sort of naturally influenced based on natural geography. And all of these things influence that. So natural conditions, natural conditions, and built features such as buildings, the slope, the solar exposure, the exposure of that area, hardscaping. Now in hardscaping, we use, the, we use this term a lot in the landscape world. And what hardscaping is, is are all the areas that are typically considered impermeable. So concrete, asphalt, driveways, parking lots, sidewalks, downtown centers, et cetera, all of the hard in areas. And the reason that that's important to take into account is that typically it can create a heat island effect, okay? So it can affect how hot certain areas are. Um, other things, wind breaks, buildings, the built environment. Now, why do these microclimates matter. Microclimates matter um, uh, because it does influence our irrigation schedules, how we irrigate, when we irrigate, how long we need to irrigate for, how much water we need to put down. We will go into that. Um, it affects our plant selections. Okay? And this is a big one. This is sort of like the main point behind really getting a thorough, thorough understanding of 
plant cultural requirements. It also informs design choices. Okay, so all of these, this is why microclimates matter. Watersheds. Watersheds are an important thing to consider for a lot of reasons. So what is a watershed? A watershed is all the land in a region from which rain collects and drains into a common creek, river, lake, or bay. The water in a watershed moves across land and through storm drain systems, both underground and on the surface. Okay, so storm drain systems can be built systems. They can also be natural systems. Okay, um, and those natural systems, that water can travel across land through natural storm drain systems, as well as below land through natural systems, okay? So water tables, et cetera. So really what we're looking at, um, we are within the San Francisco Bay Delta watershed, okay? Now, this is a massive watershed, 60,000 square miles, it includes the largest estuary in Western North America. It extends from the Sierras, peaks of the Sierras, to the Golden Gate. It includes the Sacramento and San Joaquin Rivers. Okay, so the northern area and the southern area of the Central Valley. So really through this, I mean, this is the Sacramento Valley includes the Sacramento River, but a lot of times we think of the entire basin as the Central Valley. Um, uh, and everything within this drains out to the Pacific Ocean. So you can see that the watershed that we're within, right, if we're talking about Sacramento and greater Sacramento region, we're actually in a really interesting spot because running along the peaks of the Sierras all the way up into Oregon, wrapping down and through west of Lake Shasta, right, up and around Clear Lake, all of this ends up going out. All the water that falls within these regions ends up going out through the Delta, through San Pablo Bay, and out into the Pacific Ocean through the Golden Gate, okay? It is massive. Now, within these regions, there's a lot of interesting plant communities to look at. And this is a really good way to start to get to understand different regions, what the plant communities are, recognizing what plant community you are are working within, and sometimes it can be challenging to sit down in an urban environment and say, I'm in a coastal prairie, right? Um, now, of course, there's resources for that. So we're gonna share some resources at the end of the presentation here. But generally, within our watershed, we're looking at coastal prairie plant community, northern coastal scrub, valley grasslands, redwood forests, valley and foothill woodlands, and riparian woodland, okay? So to go through each one of these and some characteristics of each, the coastal prairie generally occupies slopes close to the bay or the delta, and this community is dominated by grasses and low herbs. So um, areas that would have been coastal prairie uh, uh, Oakland is an excellent example. The lower lying areas of Oakland was coastal prairie. Okay. Of course, it's very urbanized now, so it's quite different. Um, and e examples of plants that are found within these this coastal prairie plant community, Achillea millifolium, that's white yarrow, Erydron glaucus, seaside daisy, California poppy, some fescue, some bunch grass, the Douglas iris that is shown here, and Cicerinchium bellum, okay, blue-eyed grass. 
Okay, so all of these are found within, typically within that coastal prairie. Now, as we pop through some of these, the coastal prairie, right, it's a definitely a um, distinct plant community, right, a distinct plant climate from a overall general temperature standpoint, from a precipitation standpoint. Of course, some of these plants prefer a little bit more shade, some plants, some of these plants prefer a little bit more sun. The majority of these, because it's coastal prairie and there's typically not tons and tons of forest area, the majority of these prefer full sun, but many of them can take partial shade as well. And something that's interesting is as we go through these different plant communities, we'll start to see some common threads. We will start to see that Achillea millifolium, and I guess, uh, let me just bring this up. This is Achillea millifolium, if you weren't familiar with it already. Okay, so this is Achillea. Now, Achillea is an interesting one. It's found pretty much in all the plant communities, for the most part, um, uh, in, in our region. Um, so really, really good one. Um, uh, other plants, uh, you do see some Cistrinchium bellum uh, in coastal prairie. You can also find Cistrinchium bellum in um, uh, valley and foothill woodlands and valley grassland. Okay, so you see some crossover between these communities. Next one we got is northern coastal scrub. Um, also known as soft chaparral. So chaparral plants um, uh, uh, this one is considered northern coastal scrub and that's primarily because we're in northern California. Well, many of the plants found within northern coastal scrub are also part of soft chaparral, um, uh, which is um, more of a general, um, plant community that stretches not only throughout uh, coastal uh, Northern California, but throughout coastal California as well. So plants that we find in this, uh, so um, where we find this often found close to coastal prairie. So generally just uphill from coastal prairie on west facing slopes of thin soil there's a heavy amount of marine exposure or influence, and it's typically dominated by low shrubs, okay? Dominated by low shrubs. Typically it's dominated by lower shrubs because there's more wind, okay? And plants um, generally will adapt to being in windier conditions, and so they're typically lower in height. Some plants that we find in these areas, Arctostaphylus or Manzanitas, Artemisia or our coast sagebrush, Baccarus or coyote brush, many species of Ceanothus, and even California figwort. Valley grassland, um, once very common in interior valleys, valley grassland has really suffered from agricultural development and introduction of. Uh -huh invasive weeds. Sorry about that. Um, urbanization. And these areas were prone to seasonal flooding. So Sacramento and the greater Sacramento region is an excellent example of valley grassland. And this statement here, grassland has suffered from agricultural development. And I'm really having a hard time with that one. Um, urbanization, okay? Think about it. The levee system that we have throughout the greater, greater Sacramento region. The point of those levees is to control the flow of water and protect, well, originally it was to create areas for um, industry uh, and agriculture. 
before these massive human built developments. Typically on a yearly basis, um, our region would flood. So the interesting thing about plants from the valley grassland community is that while the region itself is prone to seasonal flooding, plants that are native to the valley grassland plant community can endure periods of complete saturation, which is fascinating because this is a typical plant community that's pulled from in order to select plants for stormwater drainage systems that are built. So bioswales, green stormwater infrastructure, basins, bioretention basins, et cetera. And we select those because those areas, those built areas are set up to allow water from a large area of impervious surfaces to collect into a smaller, deeper area. But we need the plants that are planted within those spaces to be able to endure saturation, periods of complete water inundation. Plants that show up in these areas, Mullenbergia rigens are deer grass. So deer grass can withstand those conditions. California poppy can certainly withstand those conditions because during those periods of complete inundation, it's in seed form. Okay, so interesting, a very interesting plant community that has been pretty horribly disturbed, right? We built levees so that we could build our urban areas. We built levees so that we could control water and develop um, uh, agricultural lands. In the process, we significantly reduced the amount of naturally occurring valley grasslands. Okay? But we also recognize that, hey, these, these plants are adapted to being completely covered with water for certain periods of the time during the winter. And we can utilize those plants in certain areas that are intended for water inundation. Redwood forest. These, this, is, this is a great one. I imagine that the majority of us have had the opportunity to experience redwoods in their natural environment. Okay? Sacramento region is not a redwood forest. It's important to recognize that. I know that lots of redwoods are planted in our region. Uh, people love them, they're beautiful plants. Um, uh, but it's important to recognize that there's a natural occurring, naturally occurring redwood forest plant community, stretches basically from Santa Cruz-ish up into Northern California and into Oregon, the Pacific Northwest. Um, uh, and um, uh, it's a distinct, like, so the, the redwood forest itself creates a very distinct plant community in the understory of those redwoods. Typically, there's more shade, very, very high organic matter. It can be flat or sloped, but typically there's a lot of moisture in the air and it's primarily due to coastal influence, but also due to the activity of those redwoods. So plants that we see, um, we see huckleberry, we see some different types of ceanothus in these regions, um, wild ginger, Pacific Bleeding Heart. Okay? So we see a lot of interesting plants that are distinct to um, this plant community. Right. Uh, 
Valley and Foothill Woodland, okay, Valley and Foothill Woodland includes open oak savanna with grassy understory, some dense oak groves crowded with shrubs and herbs, and shady bay laurel woods, particularly rich in ecological diversity. Plants that we find within this are California strawberry, uh, silk tassel, Gary elliptica, ribes, okay, our native flowering currants, um, Rosa californica, yerba buena. Now this is an interesting one because we see the valley and foothill woodland in areas like Sunol and Eastern Pleasanton, kind of that region through there. We see it on the um, uh, foothill sides, both east and west sides of our coastal mountain ranges, as well as within the foothill regions of the eastern Sacramento or Central Valley. Okay, so it's really a foothill woodland also bleeds down into valley as well. And this is where we find typically a lot of oaks, um, some, uh, some bays, uh, etc. Okay, so very, very interesting plant community. That's that, this one's drawn upon a lot as well. And this, this note here, particularly rich in ecological diversity. Um, and it really is. There's a lot of plants within this, um, uh, this plant community. Uh, and I guess I should say, not only are there a lot of diverse plants within this community, but along with the diverse plants within the community, there's also many, many um, uh, plants, sorry, animals, insects, et cetera, that really thrive within those regions. Finally, we have riparian woodland, okay? Now riparian is typically associated with lots of water. These are areas that are narrow bands in steep ravines, broadly meandering in the flatter lands, this includes specially adapted set of water loving plants that line local creeks and rivers. Okay, so if we're walking along the American River, we're going to see a lot of plants from this plant community within that area. And if we go maybe a quarter mile to a half mile outside of or away from the river, we're not going to see those plants naturally occurring. So some of these plants include cornus, some of the dogwoods, Rosa californica, certainly we see a lot of that. Uh, we do see a lot of equisetum, the horsetail or scouring horsetail rush, um, uh, monkey flower, uh, vitus californica. We see a ton of California grape within the American River Parkway, right? Like we, it's, it's all over the place. So now this is a good opportunity to simply state that not all California native plants are drought tolerant because there's areas of California that have water year round. Okay? And so again, very important to recognize that. Now, We've talked a lot about these plant communities. Let's talk about some of the actual climate zones or climate maps and resources. Okay, so the first one that's used from a temperature and climate standpoint, this is the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture Climate Zones. Now, this system is generally and primarily utilized for agricultural purposes, being food, growing food. Now, the USDA approach is average annual extreme minimum temperature. Okay, that is how it's developed. So um, these uh, general climate zones go from um, one to 
15. I think it goes 1 to 15. We happen to be in zone 9. Okay. So if we zip back here, we see our zone 9, 9A and 9B. We come into our Sacramento region here. We're really sitting within that 9B. Now, that 9B is the only deciding factor on it is that the average annual extreme minimum temperature is 25 to 30 degrees. Okay, that's the only thing that it's based on. So that being said, that's telling us that there's some plants that cannot stand temperatures lower than 25 degrees that shouldn't be grown in our, or that can be grown in our region, right? Um, if there's certain plants, and there's a lot of them, that can't withstand winter temperatures below 30 degrees, can it be planted in the Sacramento region? Yes. Will it have to require significant input in order to make sure that it thrives? Probably, right? It's gonna need some babying. And along with that, if it's not babied, and even if it is babied, right? Cared for, coddled, kept warm in the winter time, et cetera, chances are that that plant is gonna go into stress when it goes into stress, it's going to be more susceptible to pest and disease pressure. When plants are more susceptible to pest and disease pressure, we tend to fertilize them more with chemical inputs, typically. And we need to spray them with pesticides, right? So veering outside of... Um, of a USDA zone uh, is risky for the plant, right? We're gonna need to give it more inputs. Now, USDA plant hardiness zone map, we see that our Sacramento region is in zone 9B. We also see that Eureka is in zone 9B. Crescent City is in zone 9B, right? And if we think about it, there's very significant difference between the growing conditions in Sacramento and the growing conditions in Eureka or Crescent City. To drive that point home, if we look at this map, let's take this moss, this zone eight. The temperatures in zone eight can get down to 10 to 20 degrees that 8A and 8B separates it by five degrees, okay? So there are some differences within these zones, but minor, okay? Now, if we look at this zone eight and we look at the areas or the regions within the United States that are within zone eight, we get Pacific Northwest, Northwest Washington in the same zone as parts of Northern Florida. Now, yes, the winter extreme low may be 10 to 20 degrees within both of these areas, but the actual growing conditions of those plants is significantly different. So while USDA is a pretty standard way to look at hardiness zones of plants, there's some significant differences in those zones that need to be looked at a little bit more carefully in order to properly select plants. The preferred method is the sunset garden climate zones. Now, these are de determined by several factors, not just low temperature. They're determined by latitude, 
elevation, remember topography, ocean influence, significant, right? The oceanic influence is significant. Also by continental air influence, right? Um, now, what that means is on the West Coast and shoot, you know, Gulf Coast, Atlantic, there is marine influence in all of these areas. Okay. Typically, it will keep areas adjacent and to the coast and that are influenced by the coast. It will keep those areas cooler in the summertime. Also influenced by continental air. Okay. So once we get inland and we don't have the influence of the ocean, then the land mass itself influences air temperatures and air movement mountains and hills, and finally, local terrain and microclimates. So if we dive into looking at our climate zones within our region, we'll look at Northern California in general, but here we are in Sacramento, right? Here we are in Sacramento, and we see that we're heavily influenced by the Bay and the Delta. So just within this small region, we've got zone seven all the way up to zone 17, okay? We're crossing over seven different climate zones, skipping a couple, right? We don't have 10 in here, no 11, 12, or 13. Okay. But it's a significant crossover from a lot of different climates. So we see what this oceanic influence does. We get that buildup of marine influence and fog. And typically that cool air will rush into the bay. And because the bay stretches all the way through to the delta and frankly, I'm in West Sacramento and I'm at 20 feet of elevation. So the elevation in relation to the ocean and the flat land between the bay and Sacramento makes it so that we benefit from some of that cool air that comes off of the bay, that comes in from the Pacific Ocean we also benefit from the air movement, right? In the greater, you know, Central Valley, it gets hot and that hot air mass influenced by the land, right? A lot of times that air pushes up, hot air rises, cool air sinks. And in that process, the air that's influenced, right? That cooler air off of the bay that comes in from the Pacific Ocean generally spreads through. And that's why Sacramento, Davis, other lower lying areas are within zone 14. Same zone as Napa, same zone as Santa Rosa, as Sonoma, Walnut Creek, right? So um, uh, this is why we get the Delta breeze at night, right? On those hot, hot days, later in, late in the afternoon, sometime in the evening, we get that cooler air pushing in and we actually feel that cooler breeze. And from a human standpoint, we notice it. From a plant standpoint, it makes a big difference. So if we zoom out and we look at Northern California, again, we see Sacramento here, zone 14. Now, adjacent to us, right? Uh, well, I guess even we've got Sacramento, but then as we're pushing up, we cross over zone eight and into zone nine, right? Just going from Sacramento to Roseville, we cross from zone 14 through zone eight, into zone nine. And of course we pop up into Auburn, um, Colfax, et cetera. We pop into zone seven. 
Okay. So looking at this, we can jump in and here's a link. I'm going to ask you a couple questions that forces you to explore the differences between some of these areas. So if I just jump on here right quick. There we go. So if we are diving into our Northern California, we see zone one, right? That's up like higher in the Sierras. Um, zone two is also in there. Now within the general greater Sacramento region, we've got, uh, what was it? We've got zone 14, eight and nine are the general zones. zone eight, nine, and 14, okay? Northern California's inland areas with some ocean influence, okay? So it has a really nice description of what's happening within that zone so that it can help to recognize it. Now, zone eight and zone nine, okay? These are the ones I want you to look into. You have the link, you'll be able to jump in here. Zone eight, is cold air basins of California. And then zone nine are thermal belts of California. From an overall temperature standpoint, they're almost identical. The big difference is really the elevation, okay? Whereas zone nine is a thermal belt, remember, cool air sinks, it falls to the bottom while hot air moves up. So in those cooler months, we get cool air that crosses over zone nine and collects in zone eight. Okay, and that's why it's a lower zone. This is it's kind of odd, right? Because we go from zone eight up to zone nine down to zone seven, right? And I think we can all agree that Nevada City is gonna be significant cool, significantly cooler than Roseville in the, in the wintertime, right? So, interesting and really looking at this zone eight to zone nine and looking at what the true differences are. And that's really the true difference is that cool air settles within the zone eight and stays there for a longer period of time. Whereas zone nine, that cool air travels through it. Okay. Thermal belt versus a basin. So you're gonna be able to dive into that. Now, here's some resources for searching or researching plants based on climate. First one I'm gonna jump into, oh, actually I'm gonna pull this up on something else. Oh, wait, how about that? Uh, I don't wanna restore pages, let's sit that down. And back to Achillea, here is, here's Plant Master. There we go. So Plant Master, I have a paid subscription. I use the heck out of Plant Master. Um, so if we just go to Plant Master in general, um, I'm going to go into plants and I'm going to do a plant search. Within plant search, I can click on zones or natives. I can select sunset zones and I wanna select sunset zone 14, nine and eight. I want a plant that will work in any of those zones that the greater Sacramento, that area falls within. Um, and from here, I can uh, select that I'm looking for a shrub that is, Culture, cultural characteristics. We've got solar exposure, water, soil type, conditions, pH, certain tolerances, et cetera. These are our cultural conditions. So I want full sun. I want very low water. And I'm down from 9,602 plants to choose from down to 542, okay? So we utilize our 
sunset climate zones. And this one does have the USDA climate zones as well, right? So we could select from that, but it's much more specific to select using the sunset climate zones. So great resource. Again, this is a paid um, subscription, but I use it heavily for um, my line of work. What else is in here? So uh, next one, Cal Poly Select Tree. This is free. Let's zip into Cal Poly Select Tree. This is a great resource. So within Cal Poly Select Tree, you can go to tree selection. And here you can put in that we're looking for something in sunset zone 14, 8, and 9. And we want very low water use. And we want a tree that's max height is 40 feet. Let's see what happens here. 53 trees, All right? Of course, there's many more um, uh, plants that could work. Um, within this, but I did the constraint of 40 feet. Now, to jump back a little ways and think back to um, plants and the Mediterranean regions, if we look at a lot of these plants, first one that popped up was um, uh, an acacia, uh, let's see, an acacia, um, I don't know how this is like listed. This looks a little out of order, but we see acacia. Acacias, for the most part, native to Australia. Um, we see tree aloe, South Africa. Desert willow, southwestern United States. Eucalyptus, Australia. Uh, myrtles, sure, they're going to come in. Those are uh, Asian natives. Uh, uh, I guess that was it, huh? Okay, so great resource for this. Uh, let's pop back in here. Oh, there's our second one. Uh, let's see, oleander, Parkinsonia. This is one of those plants that uh, we've talked about this one photosynthesizes in its bark. So it has green bark. Quercus are oaks. Mm, this is actually not an Australian um, acacia. This is a North, North American Southwest. And we've got some yuccas in here, et cetera. Okay, but point being, when we're doing our searches, we want to select first the climate zone okay and again whether we're utilizing the sunset zone system or usda but sunset zone is strongly preferred okay we want to start with that sorry i lost my way here there we go next one here uh calscape calscape is great now in calscape um you can go to an advanced search. Now, the advanced search features in here are by plant type, solar exposure, how the soil drains, its water requirements, how easy it is to care for, common uses, etc. What we don't see here are those climate zones. The nice thing about Calscape, though, is that you can just put in a zip code. I've said I'm in West Sacramento, so there's my zip code. Boom, enter that. And it's going to pull uh, 417 plants that are native to this area. Of course, it's pulling from plants that would naturally occur in the West Sacramento area. Okay, so you can utilize this for wherever you're actually working, you can 
or where the project is or where you're planning on growing plants, you can look into what plants would have naturally occurred in this region and use it to start selecting plants that would be appropriate in these regions, okay? So great resource for that. Next one, the next three are all nurseries, wholesale and retail nurseries. So Monrovia actually has some, uh, I actually use this one, okay? So again, it doesn't go into the zone, but we can again put in the zip code, okay? And what this is doing is saying, okay, well, in this case, zone nine, it's using USDA, okay? Um, but it is recognizing um, uh, some sort of climate zone. So it's taking its huge list of all the different plants and it's saying, okay, well, these plants are gonna go into this climate zone. And so here's the ones that we're gonna be proposing. Um, go into shrubs, let's select shrubs, our light needs, I'm gonna do full sun, uh, water needs, I'm gonna do low again, and uh, let's just see what pops up. Okay, so oh, there's our lavandula, remember that Mediterranean basin. Um, <laughs> Lantana, olive, Mediterranean basin. All right, so first stop if we're looking at plant cultural requirements is um, uh, really looking at the overall climate. Okay, in our region, we're in a Mediterranean climate. Then there's some other specific microclimates within that that we need to start to hone it in on. Devil Mountain Nursery, also a great resource. Okay, and I use the plant catalog and typically the way that I'll navigate this one is, don't want that. Um, I will uh, go in and I'll select deciduous shrubs. And from here, I can select water needs as low, sun as full sun, and here we have these constraints. So we're going to go in and we're going to, I want to see more. I want zone eight, nine, and 14. There we go. Okay, so we've gone from an excessive amount of plants down to very few plants here, right? Again, recognizing where, oh, there's our ribes, right? California native, Sambucus, yeah, it's actually a good list. Symphocarpus, oh man, that's a good plant. Great plants here. Anyways, whole point of this is climactic zones. Okay, what the, generally we're looking at temperature, but we're with, and, and that is with the um, temperature is with USDA, but the sunset climate zones really are the best way to really look at these different climates and what plants will really thrive within these areas. Um, Couple notes here. Yep, Devil Mountain's good. Now, San Marcos Growers. San Marcos Growers is a great resource. I may have talked about this already to do some searches, right? But the really nice thing about San Marcos Growers is that when you look up plants, let's do acacia and we'll do acacia cognata. It's got some really good information on it. Okay. So they're not, they're not listing the sunset garden right, the, the sunset garden climate zones. They're saying winter hardiness 20 to 25, but what I really appreciate about San Marcos growers is that they have a phenomenal amount of information in description. So you can really get to know these plants, okay? So there's the resources. That is your spiel on climate zones and cultural requirements, specifically temperature, but as we've learned, 
there's way more to it than just temperature. And that's it. Thank you.